Hi everyone, I'm Shaylin here with Reedsy. So in today's video, we've got another reaction video. So a couple weeks ago, we did a video where I reacted to Stephen King's writing advice. Um, I hadn't seen the clips beforehand. Today, we've got another video in that style. I'm going to be reacting to Brandon Sanderson's writing advice. I haven't seen the clips before, but I also might have seen the clips before because I used to watch Brandon Sanderson's writing channel all of the time. Back when I was a teenager writing a high fantasy novel, I would watch his lectures all the time. So I am familiar with his writing craft videos, um, but it has been a while since I watched them. I have read a number of his books, so I'm pretty familiar with his work and his whole approach to writing. So that's really all there is to say. Let's just jump into it. First one is something that a lot of us authors do, which is called borrowing your structure. If you have a favorite genre of story or a type of story or even just a movie you've loved, one way to get yourself into writing and kind of maybe have, so, so to speak, some training wheels on is to go watch that movie and say, all right, can I boil this down to its fundamental structure? Then rebuild that structure with a new set of characters and a new problem to solve um, and a new character arc that is my own. A lot of times this works really well if you transpose the genre. If you... Studying any story's structure is a great way to learn structure in general. I never even thought about trying to use like the structure of a, fa of a mystery novel to write your sci-fi novel. But that's... I feel like that's genius. Say, really love the uh, stories that are told in Regency Romances done by Jane Austen. And you say, what if I took this same structure and I made it a Western instead? These sorts of transpositions can also help you add a little more flair, a little bit more of your own style, but you still, like I said, have those training wheels. Thinking about Brandon Sanderson's work, I've read a number of his books, but the first of his books that I ever read was the Mistborn Trilogy. And I know the first book in that series is essentially a heist novel, but it's high fantasy. This is, I think, a moment of, of brilliance. <laughs> I definitely think studying structure and breaking down the structure of stories that you think are effective is a great way to learn structure. I never even thought about transposing structure across genres, but it's quite, it's quite brilliant, I think. Number two cool way to start writing a book if you've never tried it is to begin with a monologue. Even if your story isn't going to be first-person perspective, meaning it's not going to be told from one character's viewpoint telling the story um, as they are experienced it. You can still really get into a character by basically interviewing them or having them tell you about a really important time in their life, and you write it out as if they were sitting there and telling you about their story. Now, this probably won't end up in your final book, but one of the cool things is, is if you design it the right way, this can become pieces of this can be the little blurbs that we call them epigraphs at the start of chapters. Could be excerpts from the character's journal or diary or something like that. That's definitely a very good character development exercise. I think trying to write from a character's own voice is always a great way to get to know a character. Um, you can think about a character as much as you like. You can fill out character profiles. I think for most people the best way to learn about your character is to spend time with them the way that you would if you were getting to know a real person. It's interesting that he says that you can use those as epigraphs before chapters because that's pretty uncommon. It's not every book that just has first person excerpts before a chapter. I suppose you could do that. It seems like weird advice to give because it's pretty, it's a pretty specific way of structuring something though. The way that it would make more sense to me is you might use bits of those monologue as interior narrative in the actual book, like in the actual story, even if you are writing in third person and you do all these first person monologue character exercises, you might rewrite some of it in third person because it's actually relevant at points in your story. Um, a lot of character development work can definitely be like repurposed in the actual book for sure. Maybe you'll just love this format and write what we call an epistolary novel, which is a novel written entirely in journal forms. It's kind of the found footage version of novels. So give that a try. Just have the character write as, as if you were them explaining about their life. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything to disagree with on that one. That's a really good exercise. I don't tend to do that exercise exactly, but for me, when I first get an idea and I'm first working on an idea, I like to just write scenes. 
you know, the first chapter, whatever. I like to just write a couple scenes, like, as, like, a test run to learn about the character. And I tend to write in first person anyways, and I tend to write more interior novels, like, le not very action heavy. So I think for me, just, like, writing an actual scene would have a lot of internal monologue anyway. If you would prefer to do an exercise where you're writing, you know, like, a letter or a journal entry from your character, that is a really good way to get to know a character especially for characters who aren't your point of view characters. If you're struggling with a character, maybe a side character, you might find that the reason you're struggling with them is because you've never actually spent time in their minds. And so doing an exercise like he's describing where you write a journal entry or you write a letter or really anything from this character's point of view will let you actually get to experience this character's perspective and probably learn a lot about them. That's an exercise I turn to when I'm struggling with side characterization. Developing side characters is definitely one of my biggest weaknesses and something I struggle with a lot. This exercises like this are a really good way to develop your side characters. For me, the reason I'm way better at developing protagonists is because I have access to their internal narrative. And so if I'm struggling with a side character, it's kind of like, well, maybe I should do the thing that helps me develop my protagonists and give my, my side characters that same attention. Number three, one way to really dig into a character is to ask yourself, what does my character want? What do they need? How are those two things different? And why can't they have either one? And if you ask yourself- What he just laid out there in many ways is like main character 101. If you can nail down those things that he just described, you really have a solid foundation for a character. Obviously, there's so much more that goes into developing a character, um, like their personality and all their backstory and all of that. Those things he just described about wants and needs and them conflicting is what provides goals and internal conflict, makes a character kind of worth following and gives them a story. It doesn't just make them a person. Developing their personality and their backstory and all of that makes them a person, but what he just described makes them a person with a story. What he just said is like always a great thing to come back to. If you're ever struggling with a character, it might be because you don't know what they want or you don't know what they need or you don't know how those things conflict. It can help you to generate and construct a plot even on the fly. This is just a really good way to start making sure that your story is character centered. If your story is turning around this character's needs and wants, then you will naturally be including the character in a lot of the story decisions. One way you can go wrong. It's totally true. So I find that if I'm writing and something is wrong, the story is not moving anymore, it's usually because there's a problem with these things. You know, the character's goal is not clear or I'm trying to make the character act in a way that's the opposite of what they want. A lot of the time, like, <laughs> you can fix so many issues with the story by just coming back to these basic things because it's like he said, if you have those things, the story kind of self-generates because in many ways, if the character has a goal, in many ways that's like the natural momentum of a story. That's like the fuel, right? If the character wants something, then they're going to be pursuing something and they're going to act in a way that tries to get them towards that goal. If they need something that conflicts with what they want, then there's internal conflict they're going to have to make difficult decisions, they're going to have to make sacrifices, and they're going to be forced to grow and change, and you're going to have a character arc. So, you know, if you feel like something is wrong with your story, that might be the first thing to look at. If there's something wrong with my story and something's not working, the first thing I always look for is if there's an issue with character goal. Because if you don't know what that is, or if it doesn't make sense, the story won't move. With a book is by making the character not want or need anything, and a lot of times what will happen is that character becomes an external observer of some really interesting story happening with some other character. Uh, and as a writing professor, I see this quite a bit from new writers where they've picked the wrong viewpoint. Someone really interesting is doing something and this character that they thought would be their main character is just observing and, uh, and commenting on it. You always want to be picking the viewpoint character who is either changing the most, having the most um, uh, conflict in their life, or who is actively working on getting what they want the most. Or all three. Number four tip is choose your type of progress. I have an entire lecture on this, but if I boil it down, stories are built from three ideas. They're a promise, 
progress toward that promise and a payoff on that promise. And the progress part is the important part. That's what the bulk of your story is. We get pulled through stories. Things become page turners because we can watch progress toward a goal. In a lot of stories, this might be, for instance, a travel log. You say, we are starting in the Shire and we are going to end at Mount Doom where the ring was forged. And we can watch on the map as the characters get closer and closer and closer. We can see their progress. We can see where they get diverted and can't go the direction where they thought they were going to go because it's difficult. You want always in your story to be moving in a direction, mostly forward, sometimes backward. And this progress does not have to be travelogue. In a mystery, usually the progress is clues. That's a really interesting way of describing it. I mean, it makes so much sense. He's describing what is a plot, obviously, but I've never actually heard those terms used. Maybe those are like his terms that he tends to use. It makes a lot of sense, right? Like if a story is not progressing, that's when it becomes boring because the reader is spending time with the book without feeling like anything is changing. Um, so this is a really like simple way of articulating what a plot is. I really like it. I've not heard those specific terms before. It's an information progress, meaning you have a mystery. You don't know who killed this person. Your characters are going to get clues, information that build upon one another. And some of them are false clues. Some of them are steps backward. Some of them lead you the wrong direction. But you can get a sense as a reader that more clues are gathering and the image of who did this is becoming more and more and more clear. So decide your type of progress and make sure that you are signposting that progress is being made. Most of the time when readers complain about a story, not moving quickly enough, not having good pacing, or not being a page turner, it's because the author is not signposting the type of progress that the story is supposed to be making. That's also very clever. I, what is moving forward is not the same in every single story because different conflicts need different types of progress to develop. Brandon Sanderson is very good at explaining how writing craft works. I mean, that's, I think, why people like his lectures so much because he's just very good at explaining how things work really clearly. He makes it kind of sound simple, you know? Like, he's like, yeah, plot, you know? There's a promise, you progress, and then there's payoff. Like, he almost makes it sound easy and makes it very approachable sounding. I like that approach, you know? Writing craft itself and rules it themselves are often kind of simple. It's how you apply them and what you do with them that makes stories really complex. Before I write, I really like to do something else for a little while. And if you're going to be writing consistently to try and hit this 50,000 word goal, you're going to be writing 1,700 words a day on average is what I believe it's going to be. It's a lot of writing if you haven't done it before. And a lot of times you'll run into situations where you're like, I have no idea what to do next. One way to avoid this is to prime your mind with what you're going to write before. This works really well when you have some sort of empty space in your life where you can't be writing because you're doing something, but you can be thinking. Maybe it's during your commute. Maybe it's during your morning workout. Maybe it's when you're doing the dishes or mowing the lawn. Something that keeps your body active but leaves your mind free. Instead of letting it drift off, say, all right, when I write my next section of my story, what am I going to do? What's the exciting thing I can have happen? And imagine it, play it through. Put on headphones, if you're like me, and play some music that matches the tone of the scene that you're going to write. And prime yourself so that when you sit down to work on that scene, you just get going because you've thought through this three or four times during the commute. You know where this story is going for this next 1,500 words, and you can just write it. This is such good advice. Um, it's so true. You will normally do the best thinking when you're doing kind of like a physical task that you can kind of just do and clear your mind. It's a normal part of my writing process for me to go for a walk and listen to music just like just like Brandon Sanderson said before I write. I do exactly what he said. I have a playlist for the project. I listen to music that makes me think of my project to kind of like start thinking because for me walking is a great way to think. I had a writing professor once who said that the best job for a writer is something like tree planting because what you do is you spend all day doing a physical task that doesn't really require a lot of thought. So doing that repetitive physical task will lead you to just think about your story and, and then when you come home at the end of the day, then you write. I'm not saying we all have to go out and become tree planters, but yeah, this is like really good 
advice. I find there's so much truth to this. It doesn't need to be a lot of time. You don't have to spend a whole day tree planning. This works at least very well for me, for sure. All right, so that was all of the advice that we had from Brandon Sanderson. I agree with pretty much everything he said. Even though he describes some things that I don't think I would personally do, like I don't think I would take the structure of a certain genre and put it into another genre, like that doesn't really sound like how I would approach writing. I still do think it's really smart, good advice. And I definitely think that the reason why so many people like Brandon Sanderson's writing lectures, I mean, I used to watch them so much when I was trying to learn how to world build is because he he is really, really good at boiling down something that seems really complicated and just explaining it very simply. Like he did with plot. He was like, yeah, you know, there's a promise. There's a progress and then there's payoff. Boom, plot. Like he makes it sound really simple. I think that that is kind of the appeal, you know, of his writing advice because you don't really need to overcomplicate the craft aspect. I think a lot of the time, just knowing like the basic building blocks, like what he was talking about character, it was so simple. What do they want? What do they need? How do those things conflict? It's really simple, but it's so simple that you can kind of apply it to any character and build all the complexities of your character around that. Uh, he's a great writing instructor, he knows what he's talking about. Um, and it also definitely shows in his work, I think. When I read his work, like the plot, the characterization, the world building is always uh, very well done. He clearly knows what he's talking about. So that's all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any new videos from us. We've got new writing, editing, and publishing tips every Tuesday and Friday. Until next time, bye.